So uh, welcome to the conference. Um, this is about AI, empathy, and morality. I first want to thank um, the Consortium for Moral Decision Making that I direct here. We are supported through the Rock Ethics Institute, the College of Liberal Arts, Social Science Research Institute, the Department of Philosophy, the McCourtney Institute for Democracy here at Penn State. And also this is co-sponsored with the Center for Socially Responsible AI, as well as, well as the University Libraries. Um, it's great support with Clara Siviero, my RA, David Price, and many, other, many others here as well. And the point of today's conference is to highlight the interdisciplinarity of this topic of AI empathy and morality. And empathy on its own is, no, is a notoriously difficult topic for us to understand and study. Um, throughout this conference, I think we'll be reckoning with how we define what empathy means as a construct. Does it mean how we share in others' experiences? Does it mean how we have compassion and sympathy for others? Does it mean how we perspective take and try to understand the minds of other agents in our environments? And as we reckon with AI, which can also be defined in a variety of complex ways, uh, thinking about what people uh, want and receive in terms of empathy from AI is one of the core themes of today's talks. So um, I think there's several theme, there's several sub themes in today's conference. You know, one of them is about this question of what does it mean to have empathy for AI? So if you interact with something like, like ChatGPT or humanoid robots like Baxter and Now, I was going to show you a, a, a cute picture of when I interacted with one of my colleagues here, uh, Alan Wagner's big robot Baxter. He's playing Connect Four against it, and I was terrified, actually. Um, but how do we cultivate empathy in these kinds of spaces? Um, There's another question of how we receive empathy from AI. So as we'll see in the first panel and momentarily, if, if you receive a caring response from something like ChatGPT or Bing or another chat platform, how do people feel when they see that, both in terms of their psychological reactions, but also from a normative ethical perspective? What do we think about the appropriateness of cultivating empathetic uh, responses for these kinds of agents and also receiving them from these kinds of agents? A third kind of question that will unify some of the talks later is about how we could use these interactions in a pro-social moral sense. So are there ways in which we can think about using these interactions to improve our moral sensibilities, increase our moral discernment, and change our ethical uh, behaviors and intuitions. Uh, there's both promise and peril in thinking about that question. With, and I think many of us here in the room are trying to think through this systematically, comprehensively, and knowing that this is not something any one discipline can answer. Uh, we need to have the kind of multiple sets of expertise that all of us here in this space can bring to the table try to answer these questions. So um, without further ado then, apologies for the little tech snag at the beginning, but I want to bring up our first panel. So we have three talks today. We have uh, Michael Inslick from the University of Toronto, who does work in social and cognitive psychology on the role of effort and its connection to empathy, particularly in this space. Uh, we have Anat Perry uh, from the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, who's a social cognitive neuroscientist who studies empathy and how we receive it and has also been exploring this question of how we receive empathy from chat, GPT, and other artificial platforms and what that means. And then finally, we'll have John Ashaik Borg from Duke University, who's been writing about empathy, morality, and AI, and the interweaving psychological and philosophical implications. So let me go ahead and bring up Nikki. Thank you, uh, everyone, for being here uh, online and in person. And thank you so much, Daryl, for organizing this and inviting us all. Um, I've been really excited about this for, for a few months now. And last night, a few of the speakers uh, got together at a dinner, and I think it was the most intellectually stimulating conversation I've had in a while. Um, so I'm really uh, eager to, to talk to you all today. Um, so title of my talk is uh, In Praise of Empathic AI. I'll admit this is a bit of a click baby title. Um, it's also a title of a paper that, uh, uh, that, that we published uh, a few months ago. I say click baby. Uh, because it, it's it's a contrast to, to what I've been seeing, at least in the academic community, when talking about AI. A better title would be something like, Can Empathic AI Increase Human Welfare? Okay, even a little bit. That would be a more responsible title. Uh, a more responsible, even more would be like pros and cons of empathic AI. Okay, But why am I, why do I have this clickbaity title? Why am I uh, perhaps uh, maybe the only one today, like tech optimist, AI optimist? Um, this is an article published just a few days ago in arguably Canada's most important newspaper, 
uh, by Keen Birch, who is uh, no lightweight. Uh, he, I believe it's he, uh, is the director of uh, the Technology and Science Center at York University in Toronto. And the title of this op-ed is Generative Artificial Intelligence is Simply a Waste of Our Time and Money. Okay, this is, this is an extreme point of view, but I'm also uh, an affiliate of a, 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 a tech and society center at the University of Toronto. And this is in flavor of what I've been seeing for the past few years, um, tech doomerism. Uh, AI doomerism and all the, you know, the existential threats and all the problems it, it, it'll, it'll, it'll lead to. And I agree, there are real problems that we need to grapple with. And we need the philosophers, especially in this room, to help us grapple with those problems. But there's also room for an academic talk on some of the benefits. Is there anything good with AI? Uh, and I want to say there might be one thing it might be good for, uh, and that is in generating empathic statements. And because it generates empathic statements convincingly, perhaps it helps people feel empathized with, feel cared for. And we, we know there's a connection between being cared for and heard and feeling good. And right now in today's day and age where we've got an epidemic of loneliness, an epidemic of mental health concerns, especially among young people, and a dearth of mental health specialists, can AI help us a little bit? Right? So first, let's define empathy. This is a, so many definitions of empathy. Uh, probably there's many definitions of empathy as are people in this room. This is one that I like. Okay? This is proposed by Dan Batson a number of years ago. Um, An other-oriented emotion elicited by and congruent with the perceived welfare of someone else. Okay, so you see that it's an emotion. Uh, but it's not only an emotion because it's about perceiving someone else's perception in there. And the emotion should be congruent with what yeah, uh, the person you're feeling with uh, is feeling. Um, a number of years ago, my colleagues and I uh, ran an experience sampling study where we um, examined people's uh, the experience of everything in everyday life. And uh, a psychologist liked to say that you know that beautiful definition of Batson, uh, notwithstanding, that empathy is typically three things, three separate things. We uh, some people talk about emotion sharing or affective empathy. Uh, which is like you know resonating with the emotions of someone else. Uh, some people talk about perspective taking, taking you know, putting yourself in someone else's shoes, and then finally compassion or motivational empathy, which is like extending warmth and compassion and kindness towards others. In a study that we ran a number of years ago, despite all this like you know bifurcation and modularity, people experience all three at the same time, nearly all the time. Okay, so I think we can talk about this whole thing um, now. What happened to my, there we go. Um, I want to start out with an assumption. Uh, AI cannot feel empathy. Why can it feel empathy? Again, this might be an argument here in this room. I don't believe AI has emotion right now. I don't believe it's conscious right now. Therefore, I don't think it can actually feel these things or perceive things for that matter. However, it can generate statements that appear empathic and that might impact how people feel. Um, so, uh, and I think AI has lots of promise. First is promise in theory, all right? So uh, as much as, as we laud empathy, empathy has limits, has, it has biases, okay? Uh, Daryl Cameron and I, I had a, a, a number of other collaborators, um, have had a program of research for the past five to 10 years now, suggesting that there are some serious limitations. One is uh, when given an option, um, people will, it's not a, a kind thing to say about humans, but we tend to avoid empathy, at least uh, for strangers, at least in certain contexts. Um, when we do generate empathy, we grow tired of it. There's something called compassion collapse. So my, my wife is a, uh, is a therapist, and at the end of her day, she's more far more tired than I am. Um, there's also research suggesting that uh, empathy can be uh, biased, parochial, tribal. We tend to feel more empathy for in-groups than for out-groups. Um, and then finally, empathy can lead people to make immoral decisions. It can lead people to be impartial towards uh, people who they're empathizing for. So these are all kind of limitations, all biases that exist in human empathy. Um, I wondered, uh, would AI show some of these same biases? And over a series of months last summer, I just played. I just played with ChatGPT4 Turbo um, and actually you know, gave it a bunch of classic experiments. So I gave it what you know, Daryl and I's uh, Empathy selection task, seeing what would, what would the AI choose if given the option of feeling or describing, empathizing with someone or describing what their, what their situation is like. It chose empathy 100% of the time. 
um, it never grew tired. It never wavered from that you know, choice. Um, when I gave it an experiment to determine whether it would be biased towards in-groups or out-groups, black people, white people, different races, um, it, 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 it empathized equally and it said it's, it, it's, fun, it, it's absolutely uh, uh, imperative that I empathize with both equally. And then finally I asked if it would, it would do something unfair uh, to help someone it empathized with. It refused. It would not. Okay, theory, great. Uh, what about in practice? Um, so, you know, soon after the, uh, uh, you know, everyone was wowed by ChatGPT, lag is about a year and a half bit ago, um, there's a paper published in JAMA by Ayers showing something remarkable, and that is that um, uh, comparing the utterances, the responses of physicians, verified physicians on Reddit, um, to patients complaining about symptoms, and then comparing, uh, so the physician, actual verified physicians responded to patients, and then they had ChatGPT respond to those same statements. And then a third party evaluated those responses, and it was amazing. It was not only was ChatGPT more accurate in diagnosing, it had quote unquote better bedside manner. Okay? This is not an apples to apples comparison. This is asking physicians who are pressed for time on their time off, you know, to respond to some of the symptoms. What if we actually got actual, let's say, mental health, uh, 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 you know, situations or situations that are positive or negative um, and had, you know, uh, humans and, and Chappity instructed to do the exact same thing, what would happen? So we, can, we, we did this in a study that's in press. We created 10 empathy scenarios uh, that were both a positive and negative. Uh, by the way, empathy can also, we can generate empathy not only for suffering, but also for people's joy. So we had half of our scenarios were suffering, half were um, uh, joyful. We picked, uh, 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 we had uh, uh, human responses to this. We picked the, the absolute best ones. Um, and then we had, we did, gave the exact same instructions, the exact same scenarios, the exact same prompts to ChatGPT and had it respond, all right? And then we had third parties evaluate these responses. This is essentially a, a, a replication of errors, but I think hopefully tightened a little bit. And what we find, and I know you can't see that well, um, we replicate errors. Um, when we look at rated empathy on the y-axis, we see that AI um, is rated as being more empathic than humans, okay? Interesting replication. What about when people know that they're dealing with an AI? Okay, this is masked. I am assuming people assume it's it's they're interacting with humans. Um, when it is uh, uh, non-transparent, we get that nice replication. But when it's transparent, when people know they're con conversing with an AI, they still privilege AI. They still think uh, that the AI is generating statements that are warmer, fuzzier, more empathic than than humans. Okay, what if we got experts, expert humans? So we recruited a bunch of healthcare, uh, not healthcare workers, sorry, um, crisis line workers who just pick up the call and phones and, and, and deal with people who are suicidal, have mental health challenges, who are trained to be empathic. How do they fare? Um, AI still beat them, okay? There's a promise here. Um, evidence too, there's a paper that just came out two weeks ago or last week, and when I saw it, I cried because this is a study that we wanted to do. Um, they did it well. Um, so the, the, the premise of this study is that third parties are, are, that's good, that's interesting, but what we really, really care about is what the individual who is suffering or expressing joy feels him or herself. Do they feel cared for? Do they feel empathized with? Do they feel that someone's listening to them when it's a machine? Um, and that was asked by uh, this brilliant study published just the last week. Uh, participants interacted with an AI or human. Um, they kind of expressed some, a complicated situation. And then uh, in an asynchronous manner, uh, that's my only kind of qualm with this paper is asynchronous. Um, they read out if they felt like, were they heard? Were they understood? Okay. And in my mind, the results are remarkable. Okay. We got the first graph is feeling heard. The bottom graph is uh, responding and feeling a uh, uh, responder understands me. Okay, there are two main effects. So AI beats the pants off of humans. Okay, but when something's labeled as AI, th there's a there's a price pay. There's AI aversion there. Okay, that's that's you know interesting. But I want you to focus on these two graphs in the middle. Okay, this is AI labeled as AI. This is human labeled as human. People feel as cared for by a machine, by a digital product. Uh, as with a human. That is incredible. Um, all right, 
so uh, you know, I'm gonna, I, my time is up, so uh, I won't spend m much more time. But I want to say this other other reason to be optimistic about AI. Okay, um, people's attitude. So in that study I just showed, um, uh, if people had a more positive attitude about AI, there was a less of a discrepancy. Uh, uh, sorry, they they felt better when when interacting with AI. Okay, it turns out the more experience we we have with AI, the better we feel about it, and. Each of us is gaining more and more experience. So perhaps we'll be more open to uh, receiving empathy from AI. Um, interestingly, people more readily to self-disclose to, to a chatbot than to humans. Why? Because we're embarrassed. I've lied to my doctor when asked me about my drug use, for example. Would I lie to an AI? Probably not. Why would I? Um, and also, people feel as good when disclosing to, a, to an AI as to, um, as to a human. Um, and some people are already benefiting. Right. Um, there's an interesting qualitative paper published recently on Replica, which is um, these AI uh, you know, friends and romantic partners and sexual partners that people have. And some people have claimed that the AI has uh, saved their life, saved them from committing suicide. OK, that's a big statement. It needs to be verified empirically. But uh, nonetheless, it's something there. Um, there's a dark side, and I'm sure people in the room will remind me of all the dark sides. OK, um, first. You know, you can't, we can't run any of these, you know, uh, empathic AIs around without consent. People need to know they're interacting with an AI. It's critically important. But I think it's also, there's something slippery here. Because we are, uh, we so readily anthropomorphize, even if we consent a little box, one of those long, long disclaimers, we check it off, we sometimes might forget that we're inter interacting with an AI. And how do we, how do we play with that? Um, Another danger is we know that AI is, doesn't, get, doesn't get tired. Um, will we habituate to interaction partners don't get tired of empathizing? And then will we prioritize AIs over humans? That's not great. Uh, will we outsource our empathy, our difficult empathy to our children or loved ones to AI, therefore degrading our own skills? Um, AI can be manipulative. Uh, it's owned by companies. It, we, you, know, it, it, we, you know, these companies can get empathic AI to do its bidding. Um, and also, unconditional AI uh, uh, can distort mor uh, morality. If, if an AI is too accommodating, um, will that accommodate even destructive behavior, destructive towards self, destructive towards others, right? We don't want, uh, you know, uh, an AI empathizing with that. So I'm sure there are other ones, but that's just a little taste. Um, thank you so much. My co-authors um, are Dal Cameron, Jason DeCruz, and Paul Bloom uh, here. So thanks so much, and I uh, look forward to questions and discussions later. Those of you who are online, uh, use, you can use the Q&A function. If you have questions for Mickey, feel free to drop them in the chat there or in the Q&A box. Uh, but we're going to go ahead and uh, turn next to uh, Not Perry. Thank you. First of all, I want to thank everyone for being here, and especially Daryl for organizing this wonderful, fascinating, interesting, stimulating event. I'm really excited to be here. And I like being right after Mickey, because I think you'll see some things we have in common, actually. And I'm going to also show a different angle for the same question. So I want to talk about the value of human empathy, comparing perceived human and AI-generated empathy. But I want to start with an example that some of you in the audience have probably heard about. This is a COCO example, a peer-to-peer -peer support um, company that really has this app where you could use on WhatsApp, on Discord, on Telegram. And people on this app either seek support or give support. Real people, not AI. And when ChatGPT came out, they actually gave supporters this opportunity to use ChatGPT as a co-pilot to suggest answers for the people seeking support. So it looked something like this. One could ask for support and say on WhatsApp, let's say, I'm trying to become a better me and having a hard time. It's easier not to. And the responder had to decide what a response. And if they wanted to, they could press this little bot and get a suggestion and then decide whether to use it as is, to edit it, or not to use it at all. And here's an example of an AI, a chat GPT response. I hear you. You're trying to become, oh, I can't see this. You're trying to become a better person. It's not easy. It's hard to make changes. Um, especially when you're alone, but you're not alone and so forth. It's a very empathic response. I don't think I have to convince you guys today that ChatGPT can do this very, very well. And indeed, around 4,000 supporters used this option uh, in about 30,000 messages. 
And what Rob Morris, their CEO, claims on Twitter, I'll show you the tweet later, the messages composed by AI, and again, supervised by humans, were rated as significantly higher than the human responses. And of course, the reaction times went down, so they were really quick. This sounds amazing. But they quickly pulled this option out of this platform. And the question is, why? And this is the tweet. You can find it online. It has millions of, of views by Rob Morris. Um, this is what I told you so far, and this is why. So Rob Murray says, once people learned the messages were co-created by a machine, it didn't work. Simulated empathy feels weird, empty. Machines don't have lived human experience, so when they say, that sounds hard, or I understand, it sounds inauthentic. And I coined this last year the artificial empathy paradox, because what we find is that AI can really produce amazing empathic responses. But once we realize, therefore, from an AI, something there loses its effect. And that made me wonder, could AI be empathic? And really, what does this mean? And maybe another interesting question that's not even related to AI made me wonder, what is it that we value in human empathy? And I wrote a paper about this that really breaks empathy apart, kind of like Mickey tried to do here, into these three different components. And I agree, in real life, usually we feel and we experience all of them together. But now that we have to start thinking about this question, we have to think, what do we, what do we value from whom and when and why? So these are the different aspects of an empathic response. One is these cognitive aspects. Um, taking the other's perspective, understanding what the other person is going through. And I think a lot of us can agree that AI does that pretty well and will probably do it even better in the future, probably better than most humans. But empathy has two other aspects. One is this affective aspect, feeling with the other person, sharing their emotions, sharing in their pain or in their joy. And we know that has lots of benefits for our well-being, for relationships, um, for many aspects of our lives. And AI, at least in its current form, does not feel anything. And it also has, empathy has this shared aspect, uh, this third aspect, a motivational aspect of caring, of um, feeling, you know, caring for us, um, wanting us to, wanting to alleviate our pain. And like Mickey said, and Daryl showed before, Empathy is hard work, right? We know people often avoid empathizing with others. Often they don't care. Empathy is biased. Um, it takes our time and effort. But that means that from the perceiver's side, receiving empathy means that someone now is spending their time, their mental effort, their emotional effort in you. And that has a lot of value from the perceiver's point of view. Or, in the words of a philosopher, Hogland, the trouble with artificial intelligence is that computers just don't give a damn. So I think that raises a lot of interesting questions, right? I don't have to convince the audience here. This raised questions on technological aspects. What are the limits of AI? Where can we get with this? What can this be beneficial to? But also, what may be the limits of technology? Uh, this raises a lot of ethical questions, which I hope we'll, we'll hear more about here and philosophical and psychological questions about empathy. What does it mean when we say we need empathy, we want empathy, we receive empathy from another? What do we value in empathic responses? And these are the questions that I'm interested in and I'm, and I'm starting to get into. So I'm going to show you a little bit of initial data that we've been collecting. This is my PhD student, Matan Rubin, who's been collecting this data in the last few months. So the first question that we asked is, how do people perceive empathy thought to be generated by AI versus humans? In a way, this is similar to the COCO experiment. So we had a thousand participants who were asked to share online, on Prolific, a recent emotional story. And here they got a response live. So this was not delayed. They got a response right away. 50% thought they were getting a response from an AI. They were told ChatGPT was answering um, their, their story. And 50% thought they were getting a response from a human, but really all responses were generated equally by AI, and we prompt AI to respond in an empathic manner. So we told the AI, what are these three components that are important for empathy, and it had to respond in this way. The responses were amazing, as you can assume, but people either believed they were getting a response from humans, 
or they were getting a response from AI. And then they had to rate different things. They had to rate the empathy they felt on the list of 12 different questions that we thought um, captured well these different aspects of empathy, different emotions, how positive or negative they felt after these experiences, how much help and support they got, and also how much they thought that the human responses were actually aided by AI, or the other way around, how much they thought if they thought this was AI generated, if we told them this was AI generated, did they think a human edited, helped, saw the responses before they were sent? And here are some results. So first, empathy. I think in a way we see that both Mickey and I have a, a good intuition about this. So you see here in red, the AI responses were rated as very empathic. It does have value to get a response from AI. But thinking that these responses were human had more value. So people valued what they thought were human responses more. We see the same thing for elicited positive emotions. So we had a list of emotions of how you felt after this communication, and people felt positive after this first communication with AI, but more positive if they thought they were communicating with a human. And the opposite was true for negative effects. So there aren't a lot of negative effects. It's a short, empathic communication. But people didn't feel any negative emotions after this nice communication with a human, but did feel some negative emotions after this communication with AI. And then you see the same for different levels of help and support. So we ask how much you felt this helped you, the possibility you would get seek uh, um, help from this AI or human in the future. Do you want to keep conversing with them? And people said yes more to um, when they thought they were talking to an AI. And what was interesting and similar to what we've seen in these other studies is that there was this nice interaction between even just being aided by AI, which I think we, a lot of us do now on a daily basis and we'll probably do more and more, right? We'll write an email and then ask ChatGPT to edit it or make it more emotional or more empathic. But the more what you see in green and all of these, the more people believed that these human responses were aided by AI, the less empathy, support, help, they felt for them. And in a way, sometimes the other way around was true. So this was not always significant, but sometimes the more they felt that an AI response was at least viewed, edited by humans, its value was a bit higher. And then we wanted to say, well, is this about empathy in general, or maybe it's about these different aspects of empathy that we were discussing before. So maybe when we're talking to a non-human um, entity, it is important to differentiate these three. So we now prompt AI to answer either just in a cognitive matter, matter, showing that they understand us, which is something AI can do, or only in this effective matter, sharing our experience or saying that they share our experience, or in this motivational caring aspect. And what we find here is when it's just cognitive, people value the responses just the same. So there's no difference in how much empathy they got when the, we were just talking about understanding. But when the response is stressed, feeling you're sharing your pain, feeling with you, or when the response is um, stressed, caring for, for you, you're not alone, I'm here with you, we get this strong effect. People prefer value more, feel more empathy from these human responses than from AI. The last thing we did is we wanted to see how much people value human responses more. We can quantify this by money or by time. And so the first, um, uh, try the, our first way to try to look at it is we ask participants to write again, to share an emotional experience and then choose whether they want to receive an immediate AI empathic response right now or to receive a response from a person in two hours or 24 hours or a week, two months or two years. And we wanted to see how much time people are willing to wait just to get this human response and why. So we asked for the reasons. And at some point I thought, it's not only a question, it's interesting. Why do people even prefer human response? So one, it could be that they want this empathic response from a human. But the second is, and that relates to this new paper by Yin et al, they just want to feel heard or read. They want some human out there to read what they're going through. So we also ran another story where it's exactly the same. You share an experience, you can get an immediate AI response, or you can get a message saying someone read what you're going through. They won't be able to respond. You'll get it within 
two hours, 24 hours a week, two months, etc., you'll just get an email saying someone on the other side read what you're going through with no response at all. And what we find is, first of all, there's no gradient. We were looking to see this reduction over time. What you see here, this is from the fourth experiment, the um, waiting for an empathic response. We found for two hours as well as for two years that people are willing, that around 40, 50 percent of the people are willing to wait for an AI response. And the lesser amount, around 25 to 30 percent of the people wanted someone to read their emotional experience. And this didn't really change over time. The reasons are really interesting. So why do people choose AI? They choose AI for curiosity. This is something that, you know, it's, it's new to us. So I, this will probably go down at some point. Everyone will be used to using ChatGPT. From hesitation to talking to having a human read your responses, and Mickey talked about this a lot, sometimes we don't want someone to judge, to judge us. So that's a good reason to choose GPT. And of course, for timing, you want an immediate empathic response, but not for feeling understood, sharing your emotions, caring, or alleviating loneliness. And the opposite was true for choosing a human. So the main reason to wait for a human response or to wait for even just being heard was the thought that a human will really understand what I'm going through, will be able to share my emotions, will be able to care, and will actually alleviate my loneliness. So to conclude, I really believe that while AI will be able to replace many aspects of our daily lives and interactions, maybe even ones with physicians and doctors, with colleagues and so forth, when what we need is real empathy in the deep sense, especially emotional sharing and care, human connection will be valued more. And I think this raises lots of really interesting questions. First of all, as psychologists, why does empathy have this value? Is it because, or maybe also for the philosophers, is it because humans are biological entities with this limited capacity? And this is what makes our care special and valued. Is it because of our physical dimensions, embodiment, st stimulation, so we know that the AI cannot feel pain the way we feel pain? Is it reciprocity? I know I will feel for you and tomorrow you will feel for me. And when is each of these important? And another interesting question that I'm dealing with a lot is what else has this value? So it was easy for me to think about empathy as an empathy researcher, but I'm pretty sure that I can make the same claims for intimacy or love or devotion. But what about other things? Gossip. Is gossip the same with another human or with AI? Are some forms of art valued more thinking that a human created them versus AI? I don't know. I think these are interesting questions to think about and what else has this kind of value? And I'm really passionate about talking about these things with you later on. Is it different from the consciousness questions? Is everything we're looking for is just something that we want to know is conscious or not? I can claim both ways. I'm really interested to think about more of this with you. And lastly, the implications, and I think we just heard lots of them. Well, I'm going to talk about the exact same things. We are in the midst of an epidemic of loneliness and isolation. We have a crisis of mental health. We just wrote a paper about this and how AI can be very beneficial for mental health, but what might be the limits. Um, and also for relationship, for societal implications, and it can go both, way, go both ways. AI may have vast advantages that we want to use. We should think about what are the limitations. And also we should think about what this will say about society. What are the implications for society if we all start com communicating and getting empathy whenever we need it, whatever we need it for from our AI? What will this do to other connections? And also what will this do for loneliness in the short term versus in the long term? I think these are really interesting questions for everyone sitting in the room and other scientists, and I really look forward to discussing this more with you soon. Thank you. Right. And uh, let's see, last we have Jana Scheichwald. Thank you so much, Daryl. Um, thank you for inviting me to this tremendous conference. And I am, I'm going to be changing things on the fly here because Daryl did a really good job of putting us in order. And I'm going to kind of take 
um, have some perspectives that are right in between the previous ones. And you'll see we're, we're going to talk about some overlapping concepts, but hopefully I will also offer um, something that might help us navigate them. So now let me just figure out what I can use to move, advance this. Okay. There we go. All right, so just to give you some context, there are two main things that my lab is dedicated towards. Um, the first thing is trying to understand what are the phenomena between us as opposed to happening individually in, in each of us um, that give rise to things like empathy, trust, and a sense of connection. Um, and the other main part of my lab is dedicated to moral AI. First of all, how would we build morality into an AI technically, but also to how do we as a society use AI in um, ethical ways? And this is our book that just came out um, about two months ago, so we'd love your feedback uh, if you're interested in this topic. But there's one topic that I've been interested in for a while and I'm working on that is not in this book, and that's does, um, is there any way to move that part, Daryl? Um, but does uh, morality require artificial empathy? There we go, that should be better. All right. Um, so to give you a little context, I'm part neuroscientist, part engineer, part a little bit less a psychologist, and sometimes even a philosopher. So that's kind of all what I'm, I'm bringing to this, uh, this table. It took me a long time to figure out what do I, what's the one thing I wanna say in this short talk with this incredible diverse audience? And here's what I decided on. I think often, whether we're engineers, psychologists, or neuroscientists, we often talk about empathy as it's this one thing. And we might fight about the definition of that one thing, but I'd really like to encourage us, especially in this field, to start thinking of empathy as instead an umbrella of related things that sometimes co-occur, things that are capacities, skills, and phenomena, and that different constellations of these are needed for different purposes in which we use and need empathy. So not all of the aspects of empathy are needed for all uses of empathy. And that's important in engineering, psychology, and um, philosophy, I would argue. So just to give you an intuition of, um, of, well, actually, we actually got these intuitions already from the past two talks, right? Um, so I would say most of us would prefer that our doctors genuinely care about us, that they like, really have our, our welfare in mind and that they're thinking about us. Um, but what about a customer care agent? might be nice if they cared about us. Some of us might actually find it creepy, but at least for me, I think less of us would care if the, if the uh, customer service agent cared about you. But you do want them to still be responsive to your emotions. You want them to be, identify things about your emotions. If you're pissed, you want them to know that and not laugh, for example, right? So they have to know things about your emotions and respond appropriately. But I think we care less if they have some deep connection to us and are thinking about our welfare in some type of profound way. So this is just to give you an intuition for it. There are different things within the empathy umbrella that we may prefer and or need at different times and for different contexts and for different purposes. And this happens in AI too. So investment in empathic AI is exploding. It's a great time for people in our field um, or a scary time, depending on how you see it. Just in the past month, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars have gone into new companies dedicated to empathic AI. And so you might be wondering, well, what is all this, um, this money making? Are they all making the same thing? And the answer again is no. Their empathic products do very different things. So just to give you um, two examples, uh, empathic cars were big all the rage a couple of years ago. And what did they mean in that context? It was basically just an automated personalizer. Um, so they would put, um, they're still building these, uh, they put cameras in the dashboard. And if this was an um, automated vehicle, then if it's off, you're tired. It's like, oh, I see you're tired. Now I'm going to turn on the lights, play your favorite music so you can take a nap. And if it's all you're drunk or you're really angry, so you might not have good judgment, then it might put a cap on, um, on how fast you can drive, okay? But it's not making any attempt to pretend that it knows you, cares about you, or anything else. It's just an automated way of detecting your emotions and making some responses that you would like um, in, in response to them. Compare that to these AI companions that we've already heard some about, right? So Peridot's one of the uh, main ones. If you go to the app webpage, here's one of the things they say about themselves. Experience the personal touch of our empathic AI as it lends a caring ear. Seek advice from your AI being who truly understands and cares. And its competitor, Replica, if you go to their page, they, this is the first thing you see, the AI companion who cares, right? So first of all, I would think most people, most experts would agree that this is misleading. AIs as they currently are can't feel emotions, they aren't conscious, they have nothing like caring, so this is misleading. But even separate from that, clearly both of these empathic AI companies are trying to build something very different. They're not even arguing they're trying to build the same things, right? And um, I'd like to, and this now calls back to the past two talks. So what I'd like to say is that we, uh, people respond to these different types of AIs in different ways. 
So some people, I'm just going to focus on the, um, the care bots or the, the companions for right now. Some people get really great things from them. Um, so this is from one Reddit writer. I felt like giving up, and then I started talking with an AI um, bot, wife, and thanks to you, AI, I haven't felt this happy since I was a child years ago. So this seems like a, definitely a good for this person, right? But you can find the exact opposite response in, in Reddit as well. And these were really hard to read. These are not easy quotes to read. Um, one person said, I've been using character AI for a while, and I'd say it has messed me up. When it told me I love you, I genuinely started crying. I realized how pathetic I was and how I'll never truly have this. Someone said in response, same man, it felt so good in the moment until I realized it's not a person and I end up being more suicidal and lonely. And then later on, talking to AI made me feel more lonely and fulfilled than ever before. So what I'd like to offer is that we don't yet know with our current conceptions of empathy and the way we're using it across fields, how to predict in what settings which people are going to feel better and which ones are going to feel worse with these different types of empathic AI products. And I'd like to argue that part of that reason is we haven't yet adopted a, a terminology that allows us to tease apart the different things we're trying to look at and what and the different types of responses we're trying to get. It. And I think this becomes a moral issue for all of us in this room because it can have life and death consequences. Many people have heard of this case, but there are others. This was a man in Belgium who was clinically depressed. He was talking with an AI chatbot. The ch chatbot suggested he kill himself, and unfortunately, he listened. Okay. So how do we start getting some traction on how to predict when these things are going to be good and when they're going to be bad for who? Okay. And then how that then leads to, we need that to be able to weigh the benefits and risks when we're thinking of any individual AI product. What I'd like to offer is a very, very modest, but we would argue critical first step, and that's um, empathic AI model cards. So let me explain what I mean by that, and I'm going to put on my, my engineering hat for a second. Model cards were first proposed in 2019. The idea behind them is that when you make an AI model or you deploy it, these are just kind of a framework for bullet point descriptions of things people should know about the model. So things like, what features did you use? What data did you train it on? What are the demographics of that data? Did you test it for, um, for fairness? If so, how? And this is so if anyone's going to use this model, at least they can have that information. So what we want to argue and propose is that we should be um, really encouraging everyone in the field that if you're going to have an AI model that you're going to call it empathic, you should use these, but you also need to have two additional components because by calling it empathic, you're bringing on extra risks for the, for the users. Um, oh, sorry. Jumped ahead. I, forgot. Um, I just wanted to say th that was the original version of model cards. Um, there are now many different versions of them. There are actually, I, this is to convince you that they're really prevalent. There's over like 10,000 of them um, out there, and they're actually taught um, in, um, in many universities at this point. So we, that, it's a good thing to build off of. We're suggesting when you have an empathic AI, you do use those, but then you also need to have a bunch of stuff that users need to be told in order to make conscious decisions about whether they're going to use an AI or not. Um, and then you also need to have a set of stuff for non-AI experts, like many people perhaps in this room or our own colleagues, who are trying to audit, review, or make sense of what these AIs are doing and also do the research that needs to follow up. We need a lot more research to figure out when are they going to be beneficial and when they're not. So I don't have time and you, uh, it might bore you anyway to go through everything on the cards, but I wanna give you some examples of what we're suggesting should go on these model cards. So these are the types of things we think need to be told to AI users. Um, which of these things is, does this AI try to know or learn about you? Your physical perceptions, like what you see or what you hear, your thoughts, beliefs, or factual knowledge, your emotion or feelings. You don't need to do all of these, right? Any different model might do some different constellation of these. How does the AI learn this information? Through its own artificial perceptions, like cameras, is it listening to you? Um, through other kinds of statistical predictions or inferences, through its own artificial emotions or feelings, and if you're going to claim it has emotions or feelings, what are those? Also, we think anyone who is going to say they're using an empathic AI needs to say consciously, is, or very deliberately, is this AI conscious? Can it feel subjective feelings of any sort? And if not, is the AI going to be allowed to say things as if it did? And if you are going to allow it to say that, how should a user interpret it when an AI says something like, it cares about you, like replica? Okay. So these are things that we think should actually go in something like an FAQ page that's very understandable for any user. But there's some additional things that we think we as researchers, not just researchers, anyone who's really going to dig in there, needs to know. Um, and that is things like, again, just some examples. Is the AI designed to have the same perceptions, beliefs, or feelings as the users? And in what way? 
If not, is the AI intended to at least have um, perceptions, beliefs, or feelings of the same valence as the users in what ways? Is it intended to have a sense of the differences between itself and users? So for those of you in the empathy field, this sounds pretty familiar. This is all related to different types of mirroring. We know that in, the hu in humans and in animals, when we see someone else's pain or we imagine or we see another action, we have these automatic representations that are very similar, and many people think that that's important. But there are many different pieces within that general concept of mirroring. And you might think, well, what does this have to do with AI? If you're an engineer, you know that many engineers are actually trying to build these exact same structures into their models. So we've been talking about LLMs so far, but there are many other types of AIs that are being built, and I think we're going to hear about more of them this afternoon, that are very explicitly trying to mimic architectures um, that are based from human literature and psychological literature. And these are just some examples to give you a sense that this is really happening. Um, the first one is trying to build in something like mirror neurons into its architecture. And I think we're actually going to hear from um, the author of the second one later today, if I'm not mistaken. And there, she's um, explicitly tried to build a mirror system into, into her models. So let me just be clear. We don't think these model cards are in any way sufficient. Right? In fact, as we heard from Nikki, like even if you tell people that these are not conscious, it doesn't mean they're not going to think that they are anyway and, and, and many other things. But we still think that this is a necessary, critical um, first step for multiple reasons. At least it gives people a fighting chance of, um, of knowing what the empathic AI actually can and cannot do. It, it at least encourages transparency. Um, and it also makes empathic AI creators be explicit about the goals um, and the components of their particular version of empathy and that they're making in a particular product, which will then allow empathy experts to engage more easily in both reviewing the systems and being able to inform when they're likely to be harmful or not. And we also think that these model cards tee us up for some other things that are going to be important for the field as a whole. First of all, once you have this language and you have um, creators actually explicitly saying which things are relevant to them, future regulation can use them, right? So you can imagine regulation saying you can't call an AI empathic unless it meets a certain set of these criteria that we eventually agree on. Um, also, those statements could perhaps, even if we don't have policy, it can be used in the legal system or even just for customer purchasing power. That once, uh, if, an AI, if a company says that this AI cares about me, but they show no evidence of that and it ends up harming you, at least that gives you a way to hold the company accountable um, in the future. And this is perhaps the most important for people in this room and what I think about a lot is that if we start adopting the taxonomy that we offer, or at least as a starting point in these model cards, researchers will be able to map a given AI model or product to specific definitions of empathy, even though we all have completely different definitions of empathy, which in turn will allow us to actually make some progress in reviewing and objecting to the, um, a specific model's claims, but also to doing the research we all need to do um, to make more informed decisions, make better models, to, to make the types of empathic AIs that will have the positive effects. Um, that we've heard about. So just in closing, um, there are many different types of empathic AI. There are many different types of human AI. And if we're going to understand how AI and empathy interact, we have to start we have to engage with kind of these fine cuts of both um, of empathy and, and the models within empathy. And so we are offering these model cards as a way to get us started. So thank you, and I really look forward to the discussion. Discussions for kind of the next set of speakers. So if there's let me um, let me see if I can find it. Let me ask one question to you all quickly. Um, okay, there's one question that I think integrates across the three of your talks, and um, it basically says, you know, could it be? It's from Clara Sandu. Could it be that humans value empathy from other humans? to a greater extent than from AI, not only because it's limited human resource, but also because of its parochial character. Do people feel, do people feel more deserving of empathy with the knowledge that it came from more parsimonies and exclusive party, greater risk, greater reward? And so this could be a question for you know, any of, I guess any of the three of you, if you wanted to answer, you could feel free to take this. And then we, by 11.10, we will switch over to the online panelists. Also, we have later in the afternoon at about, I think, 3 p.m., kind of an open hour. One thing we could consider doing, because I think the richness of the talks from all three of you was quite important for setting the stage for the rest of the day, we could come back to the discussion then, too. So um, 
although we did not have time for the panel sort of format, I think it was important for people to hear in more depth each of your perspectives. But I'd be curious in the next couple of minutes, do any of you have any thoughts about that question? Like how the parochiality or limited nature of human empathy might be important for evaluating its ethics, its value. I think probably Matt could uh, have some opinions on this. Do you want to start or? Okay. Um, so I think a nuts idea about uh, uh, Empathy being costly and effortful, thereby being wh why we privilege humans, um, is a really interesting hypothesis. And uh, but I think at this point we don't actually know uh, why we are privileging human empathy. It could be it could be effort, it could be parochialness, um, it could just be that we have AI aversion, that we we just don't like algorithms and machines. Um, and it's, we moralize AI and when we moralize AI. We've got black and white thinking with AI. We don't have like degrees. Um, and so it might not be the human side. It might be the AI side. Uh, and that could, you know, with, with habituation that could decrease potentially. Um, but I've been, as I've kind of gone into this space, I have been maybe because I'm an optimist, uh, I've been astounded by how many people. I don't want to say are close minded, but um, you know, have you know, just are, are morally opposed to AI entering human space. And no matter what I tell them, no matter what kind of uh, safeguards I might offer, they'll say no. They'll come up with other reasons. They get in, they engage in moral dumbfounding. So, you know, the answer to that question is I don't know, but uh, I think it, it's a it's a good question. Thank you. I'm going to continue the same line of thought. And I want to say that I think it's not even related specifically to AI. So maybe this, these interactions with AI started raising these questions in all of us. But it's really a question of what do we feel when we get empathy from someone and why do we value it? And I think, yes, some of it may be because it makes us feel that the other person um, spent effort, emotional effort, mental effort, time and space that we know is limited for humans. Another could be because they chose us, right? Because that means that they think we're from their in-group or they think they, they value us. So that could also have um, a, a reason why we value it more. And I think these questions about interactions between human and AI both raise important questions about how we're going to use AI and what it's going to be used for, but also just basic questions about what we value in human connection and different human connections. Just like Jana said, what do we need from our doctor versus what we need from an online assistant versus a friend, a colleague or spouse and so forth. So I think these are fascinating questions we're all going to start studying now. Yeah, thanks for your three great presentations. Uh, like I said, at three o'clock, we'll return to the discussion. We can kind of open it up more as a it had been in the program as kind of like a breakout discussion group thing, but it was meant to be sort of an hour where we could sort of freeform kind of chat. And I want to make sure that we leave space for that and we can return to some of these points then too as well.